This presentation was recorded at the Best Practices for Pollinators Summit. For more information, contact pollinatorfriendly.org. Well, hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you. And I, I love Cass's work. She's just such an amazing, enthusiastic speaker, as you can see, and really knows her stuff when it comes to trees and bees. And so anyway, I've been learning from her too since she's been at Cersei's. Um, there have been so many great presentations this week, and I get to help bring the summit to a close, ending on how we can work together to leverage our power as plant buyers to get pollinator safe plants. This is all about working with your local nurseries and your large plant buyers in your area, such as large landscaping design and install companies, plant brokers, cities, campuses, departments of transportation, etc to ensure that pollinator safe plants are grown and provided for your projects. Before I dive into that really quickly, a little background. I'm with the Xerces Society too, and our organization was founded in 1971 by Robert Michael Pyle and named after this lovely little blue, the Xerces blue butterfly, which unfortunately was driven extinct by human development. What we are all about, as you may know, is protecting the life that sustains us because None of us could survive without the ecological services of invertebrates. Specifically, invertebrates are food for countless other animals. They provide pollination services. My favorite, decomposition and recycling services, which means that nutrients are available for plants to grow. They purify water and they provide natural pest control for free. So this slide just shows eight species out of the hundreds of thousands or even millions of species that are out there they're wildly diverse, sometimes incredibly beautiful, and all playing one or more of these important roles. So today, I'm gonna to talk to you about an opportunity for leveraging our, our power as plant buyers together. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some scientific studies that have looked at the question of whether plants that are available from nurseries are safe now. I'm gonna talk about solutions that Xerces is moving toward and starting to implement. And then I wanna to talk to you about approaching your local nurseries, how to do that. So in my view, we've got a huge opportunity these days. You just step back and look and see more and more and more organizations such as cities and campuses across the country, departments of transportation, restoration groups, and landscaping companies all heeding the call to restore pollinator habitat in their communities. I mean, I'll, just a little anecdote. I remember working with the city of Wilsonville, Oregon to get pollinator habitat installed in the city. This was just in 2015, 2016. And at that time, there was so little happening that we were able to sort of say, hey, we're at the cutting edge, but you know, this so much has just exploded since then. So as a result, the demand for local native and safe plants has never been higher. We see pollinator habitat restoration taken off in cities and campuses across the country, and many of those cities and, and campuses have joined the Bee City USA program. This, these photos here give you a little tiny taste of what's going on with those Bee City and campus affiliates across the country, but there are many others doing the same thing, again, along highway corridors, in natural areas, and on residential property. What's needed for this work? A robust supply of native pollinator safe plants. So you can see some examples here of nurseries that are providing those and um, both plants and seeds. Purchasing plants to create habitat within parks and public spaces is obviously part of the process in creating pollinator habitat. So the opportunity that I see here is that large buyers, especially those who collaborate with other large buyers, can leverage their joint purchasing power when procuring plants by using a contract grow procedure that can assure pollinator safe plants. I'll discuss the mechanisms of that in a minute, but first let's look at why this might be a good idea for pollinators. This gets to the question of are plants safe now? So obviously pollinators gather their food from leaves and flowers. Um, 
And in doing so, pollinators and other beneficial insects can uptake pesticides by either being sprayed directly, contacting residues on plant surfaces after a spray with their antennae or their feet um, or the, the exoskeleton. They can also consume residues that are left on or in plant tissue, or they can consume contaminated prey that um, are, have actually absorbed the pesticides. So when we buy plants and protect them from pesticides in our own gardens or parks, we can protect pollinators visiting our plants from being sprayed directly. So we can knock out number one. We can also protect them from contacting residues topically for the most part, knock out number two. But that third bullet, um, consuming residues on or in plant tissue, we really can't protect them from that unless we've taken steps to assure that we start with pollinator safe plants. And so it's important to think about what about those pollinator plants that have been grown especially to support bees or highlighted species like monarchs, can we count on those to be safe now? Well, unfortunately studies that we have, which aren't a whole lot, but we have several, they show that we can't assume that they are actually safe for pollinators. Most commercial nurseries and greenhouses do use pesticides on the plants that they produce. This can include insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides. And from those existing studies available on nursery plants, we see that typically when nursery plants are sold, basically at the retail point of sale, they typically contain lots of pesticide residues, usually multiple insecticides and fungicides and herbicides. And sometimes those residue loads are even at levels high enough to kill bees. We also see that systemic pesticides can last long enough in plant plants and sometimes be toxic enough to result in residues that are available in the leaf or nectar much later. And woody plants in particular, shrubs and trees, these can express systemic pesticides for months to years after an application. So um, this gives us some concern and you know, motivation and cause for trying to make sure that we get the safest plants we can. So what about, uh, again, going back to that question about some of these highlighted um, pollinator plants. Well, we examined this question in 2022 in detail when we teamed up with researchers at the University of Nevada to look specifically at leaf pesticide residues on and in Asclepias plants, milkweeds, the obligatory host plant for monarchs. What we found, unfortunately, is that the leaves um, from 235 plants on average had 12 different pesticides inside of them. And across the study as a whole, across those 235 milkweed plants, we found 61 pesticides over, overall. Um, the majority were insecticides and fungicides about evenly split, but we did find some herbicides. And so these results really looked concerning. What did this mean for monarchs? Unfortunately and depressingly, and goes back to our regulatory system and how pesticides are studied, but the literature on how pesticides affect monarchs is really still very slim. So the toxic effects to monarchs from pesticide exposure at the caterpillar stage are mostly unknown. Out of those 61 pesticides that we found across the study, we only had data on nine of them that we um, were able to find that were tested on monarch caterpillars. So we also found that some plants only contain two pesticides per plant, some contained up to 28. And the number of chemicals on average and up toward the higher range definitely raised questions about, do these chemicals have the ability to interact causing higher toxic effects than if alone? You know, we don't really know what that means because our, again, our regulatory system doesn't usually examine that kind of interaction. But we do know that from studies that have taken place at universities, that sometimes those interactions can um, express and cause toxicity at lower levels than if, the, um, if, if one pesticide alone was present. So concerningly, plants with a label, um, these milkweed plants, some of them contained a label saying that they were, you know, valuable for, for monarchs or valuable for pollinators. And so when we looked just at that subset, 
we found that they were almost twice as likely to contain fungicides at toxic levels. And even with only the toxicity data for the nine pesticides that we had, we found that nearly 40% of the plants contained fungicides at levels that could be detrimental to monarchs. Um, these fungicides actually occurred at concentrations that have been associated with shorter adult wing lengths, um, which results in basically smaller adult monarchs. And um, so size, specifically wing length, has been correlated with migratory ability in monarchs. And we all know that monarchs migrate, and that's one of their really um, amazing characteristics. So finding that we had fungicides in milkweeds at levels that reduce wing length that could affect the, their migratory ability raised concern. This wasn't the first time that we've seen issues associated with fungicides. You know, oftentimes when we've talked about pollinators and pesticides, we focused a lot on insecticides, but fungicides have also been associated with negative effects on pollinators. Um, previous studies, especially looking at bees, have found associations between fungicides and reduced larval survival, lower pupil weight, and reduced adult lifespan as well as sometimes some fungicides can inhibit the breakdown of insecticides. So there's a lot of concerning effects with fungicides in plants. And notably, these fungicide, um, these fungicide levels that we found across 40% of the samples, these weren't a problem in just one state or region. They came from about half of the sampled locations across the country. So um, again, we found this effect, particularly in the plants, ironically, that contained wildlife tags touting the value of milkweed for monarch and other pollinators. So this is just a huge reminder that marketing information that might be on, on plant labels doesn't give consumers a full picture. There isn't a regulatory um, sort of like standard in place for plant labels. So consumers need to be aware and talking with their nurseries, not solely relying on labels, which remain unregulated. One other point, we also found insecticides at some pretty high levels um, in the leaves. Now we weren't looking at pollen and nectar, which we would if we were analyzing for bees or flowers as a whole. But without that baseline toxicity data, we're kind of unsure about the effect of those insecticides on monarchs. We do know that they would be high if we were looking at them for bees. So I just wanna go over a few of these other studies because this study added to the existing literature about pesticide residues on nursery plants at the retail point of sale. There have been a few other studies that have looked at this issue and they summarized the first three rows in, um, in this table here. This slide has a lot of information. You don't need to try to observe it all. I just wanted you to get a sense that our concern about the problem isn't theoretical. It comes from data in published studies. So the first study, which comes from the UK, looked at 29 samples of bee-friendly plants, and um, they found that 92% of those 29 plants had residues. They had an average pesticides per plant of 3.3, which is less than what we found in the milkweed study, but they were looking at a smaller number of chemicals. They were only screening for 24 pesticides. We screened for about almost four times that many. What they found though, was that neonics were found in 70% of the plants and neonics in another insecticide call, uh, called chlorpyrifos, they were found at levels known to harm bees um, and result in impacts to growth, reproduction and or immunity. A second study um, looked at flowers, leaves and stems from bee friendly plants bought from big box retailers. Um, these were bought across the United States. There were 71 samples taken. And in that study, half of the plants had residues, but they were looking only at neonics. They weren't looking at any other kind of, of pesticide. And what they found is that of those plants, 20% of them that did have neonics contained not just one neonic, but two neonics and then or more. And the combined concentrations ranged up to really high levels, 748 parts per billion. It might not sound like a lot to you, but from a toxicity threshold level, it's really high because that's well above a level that can kill honeybees. And in stems and leaves, it would almost triple this uh, amount 
that's not uncommon when we look at plant residues that stems and leaves contain higher amounts than what we see in flowers. So when we're able to analyze stems or leaves, we might anticipate lower levels in flowers, but when we look at flowers, we need to expect that we'd see higher levels in stems and leaves. Not always you know, across the board that way, but a, a reasonable rule of thumb. Another study uh, looked at um, uh, milkweed leaves, um, looking at 11 samples and just looking at um, retail nursery plants collected in California, 100% of the plants had residues there were an average, a higher level on average per plant, 23 um, pesticides per plant. And um, this one looked at 200, it's, the study was screening for, um, you know, 262 pesticides, which is a lot. So across this study, there were 30 different pesticides detected with an average of 23 per plant. And this one was interesting because, um, again, we we're looking at milkweed plants. This is a different Cersei study. And um, when we compared to levels that are lethal for Lepidoptera, butterflies or moths, 55% of the plants were affected and the chemicals involved include, included two non-neonics in the diamide family called cyanotronilipril and chlorantronilipril. And then a smaller proportion, 18%, were also lethal for methoxyphenazide, which is another insecticide. Um, we also looked at them, you know, relative to a honeybee standard, although, again, that is stretching it a little bit because honeybees are not consuming leaf tissue, although they could, um, you know, certain bees can cut leaves and use them in their nests and be exposed in ways like that. In any case, the kind of takeaway from this complex slide is that we're seeing um, at retail point of sale that residues are extremely common. We're often finding um, chemicals that are pretty concerning, um, that we're finding that, you know, we're getting a lot of pesticides per plant typically. Sometimes we see lethal levels. So um, even, and these are, note that all of these studies only looked at pollinator valuable plants. They weren't looking at just sort of like, um, poinsettias or something like that, that, well, maybe that, maybe that poinsettia has some value to pollinate. If so, I don't know what it is, but they were specifically looking at plants valuable um, for pollinators. So don't get me wrong, please. I'm not trying to paint the nursery industry black or, you know, saying that they're insensitive to biodiversity concerns. I've talked to dozens of nursery growers and I know that many of them really come from a place of um, love and concern for the natural world. Um, but in talking to these growers and looking at a lot of different studies, I've learned a little bit about why it's hard for nurseries to go without pesticides. These are a few of the root causes or factors that result in widespread use of pesticides on nursery plants. First of all, a lot of nursery plants have grown for at least part of their life cycle in under greenhouse conditions, partly because you know, people are buying plants often in springtime, Mother's Day is peak season, and some of these plants need to be started in greenhouses um, during the middle of winter. But greenhouse conditions are often conducive to pest outbreaks because it's usually warm, humid, um, and these can, these can lead to, you know, conditions that are ripe for um, diseases. So that's one reason why we see fungicides a lot. Also, Cos a cosmetic standard, you know, all of us want our plants to look perfect when we buy them. And growers are, you know, rightfully or reasonably concerned that people won't buy their plants if they see leaf tissue damaged in any way, whether it's spots on the plants from a disease or the leaf tissue nibbled by an insect. So this is, you know, something that we all, you know, maybe have an unrealistic standard about what a plant should look like when we buy it. Um, and, you know, it affects the pesticide use that happens in the nursery. A third important factor to know about is that pesticides relative to other costs of doing business in the nursery industry, pesticides are cheap, labor is expensive. Um, studies on their nurseries, um, basically their budgets, shows that pesticides normally comprise about 2% of a nursery's budget cost outlay, but labor is about 26% of their cost outlay. 
So um, something to keep in mind, because if nursery growers have to go to more manual um, or more labor intensive techniques in order to let go of certain pesticides, they might be resistant to that. So um, just something to know. Another thing is that both state, the federal government and states, they have plant health regulations. Um, and these were put in place, you know, long ago to try to prevent uh, shipping across state lines that would basically, you know, spread infected plant tissue from one place to another. And so the really good intentions behind this, but I've talked to nursery growers who say, you know, we never know when the inspector is going to come. And if they see an, even just one little tiny problem, even if it's not an invasive plant, you know, they're going to hold us back and we can't ship. So, so sometimes nurseries are putting on maybe more than they need or more than they know is healthy just to be able to ship out of state. Um, so that's something to keep in mind too. Another factor is that for some pesticides, nurseries can actually use much higher rates per plant than what's allowed in food crops. I think this goes back to food safety um, regulations to protect people that hasn't yet gotten to a point where we're you know, trying to take food safety into account for bees and butterflies, but this is the reality of the situation and can result in really high residues. Finally, the last couple of things why I'm talking to you today is that you know, there needs to be more awareness on all of our part and uh, all of us who buy plants. Um, and it's not always easy to talk to nurseries, but um, we're trying to make it easier by helping people with some of those ways of approaching and some good questions to ask. Finally, there's no labeling rules, as I spoke about before. There's really no regula regulation around labeling. And only California requires reporting for nurseries as basically agricultural entities. Um, in terms of their pesticide use. So let's move to solutions. We at Xerxes are committed to sourcing plants that are safer for pollinators, and we know that it takes some work. So I wanna share with you now how we do that. So this goes without, without saying practically, but um, first focus on finding plants native to your local area and try to buy from a local nursery who specializes in native plants. While you can't assume that a native plant grower is avoiding all harmful pesticides, we have found many native plant growers who are very careful about their pest management practices and their pesticide choices. But you can take steps to better understand their practices through a conversation. As I said before, it's good not to assume that if it's a native plant nursery, they're doing you know, no applications or minimal applications, always good to verify through a conversation what their practices are. So we recommend that any large buyers in particular, take the time to learn about the nursery's growing um, practices, including their pest management and pesticide practices. And we have these two publications at our website, each of which provides some information and guidance about how to do that. Buying Be Safe Plants, and offering be safe plants. Buying be safe plants is geared more toward a casual consumer buying at retail. And there's a good chance large buyers are buying wholesale or using brokers. And so you can look at offering be safe plants, which would give you a, a little bit more in depth information about practices to look for and more in depth questions to ask. Utilizing these gives you as a buyer um, or your broker, a great opportunity to have an in-depth conversation with the lead grower at the production nursery. Again, this takes some work and some practice, but it really is a step worth taking. We recommend in here questions that probe nurseries monitoring and pest prevention practices, not just asking about which pesticides they use. So these questions are all outlined in these fact sheets. And getting a safe of how pollinator, getting a sense, excuse me, about how pollinator safe your grower's pest management methods are, really helps provide peace of mind and helps you to identify and favor those who are implementing the most solid and pollinator protective pest management programs. A further step you can take is to set up a contract grow. This might be a new term to you, so let's define it. Um, this definition is from Specialty Trees, um, and they define it in a pretty good way. It's contract growing is a service offered by many production nurseries 
It allows grant landscapers, developers, and designers to reserve plant material sometime before it's required, sometimes even years in advance. There's a deposit to, to secure the deal, and the pricing is locked in over the course of the job. So the material is grown and nurtured to the required specifications and then supplied when, it, when it's needed. So um, this is something that we engage in ourselves, and this is something really any large buyer could engage in. And it's a way to get assurance upfront that you can get the kinds of plants that you're looking for grown in the way that you want. In a contract grow, the nursery is usually starting the plants from scratch for you. At Xerces, our goal is to get plants that are reliably safe. Um, this means to us finished plants that are free of pesticide residues that could result in harm for pollinators when the plants are delivered. It's not an absolute standard. It doesn't mean that no pesticide residues will ever be present in the plants that we buy, but it does allow us to be reasonably certain that the most concerning pesticides will be absent from our contract grown plants when we pick them up or present at low levels only. In developing a list of the most concerning pesticides, we thought about those that are most toxic to bees and to butterflies and moths, and about the pesticides that could be more long-lived or persistent in or on plants. Specifically, our procurement policy specifies that when we engage in a contract grow, we want the plants to be protective for both adult and larval bees and adult butterflies and their caterpillars. So the specific provisions are that some pesticides are disallowed on the plants, the soil, media, or via, you know, chemigation throughout the growing period. And some pesticides are disallowed two weeks before delivery. So how it works is that specifically our template for contract growers disallows the use of 26 systemic insecticides throughout the production cycle. This eliminates the highest risk pesticides of concern. It also disallows use of several dozen other pesticides, which include certain insecticides and certain fungicides, mostly contact type, for two weeks prior to delivery. This um, allows the use of some of these chemicals throughout the growing cycle up until two weeks. Um, taken together, these increase the safety of the plants at purchase. And when we combine this um, set of specifications with the results of our interview with the nursery in which we've asked about the monitoring practices, the prevention practices that can help keep um, plant pests and diseases at a low level to start with. Um, we, and you know, that interview helps us assess those practices. Together, these steps help us support ecologically sound production overall and provide safe plants um, through our Habitat Kit program and on the farms that we do restoration on. So I'm, I'm assuming, I don't know for sure, but um, I'm assuming that those of you in the audience today is probably not composed mainly of large buyers of plants. Maybe there's a few of you in the audience. So those of you who are you know, mostly um, attending because you've got your own pollinator garden or you play some other role out there in this sort of uh, conservation ecosystem, we encourage you to think about the large buyers in your community and talk to them about adopting this approach in their purchasing. From our experience, we know that adopting this approach takes some thought, some planning, also a little bit of interpersonal skill. So let's talk through some of the steps that are involved. So first, identify likely production nurseries. Who are the main native plant nurseries in your area? What do they produce? Are those the plants that you want? What is your previous experience with them? Also, who owns the nursery and what are their attitudes toward pollinator conservation and pest management? So this is good background information to, to start with. Second, educate yourself before you walk into a conversation on those common nursery challenges. I talked about those earlier and I think nurseries really appreciate when people have a conversation with them who's at least have taken some time to try to understand what their world is like. Third, set up an interview with the lead grower. Usually this is best if you 
contact the nursery and give them some some time, you know, a couple of weeks out, let them know generally what you want to talk to them about. And um, you can interview them to better understand their general pest management practices. I will say um, in our two fact sheets that I recommended, there's, you know, sort of like the foundational questions to ask. We have developed more in-depth questions at nurseries. I'm happy to show those if anybody wants those to guide the interview. If they seem like a good candidate, then show the contract grower specifications by email and then allow time for them to review those against their current practices. They may need a couple of weeks. They may need to think through this. They may be worried that they can't do it all. Follow through if you haven't heard back in a couple of weeks. Then have another conversation. They may say, look, we can do 90% of this, but we need a few um, exceptions for these particular plants. I, I don't know what they'll say. It might be different with every nursery. Some may say, this is absolutely no problem. We can do this. Um, some may not wanna do it at all, but some may say, we just need a little bit of tweaking of this. So if they can do that, you, know, you still have um, already given yourself and them a big step forward, you know, toward this overall goal of providing pollinators safe plants. So flexibility is fine. This is a template. Then once everything has been, you know, worked out, all the details, sign the contract. So there you go. A couple of other things about about this whole process is that you may find, you know, of course, some nurseries are really eager to go this route and don't have any conflict, but others might be more hesitant. So some ways you can help make it worth their while include collaborating with other nearby large buyers. If you've got a larger order, it's gonna be more worth their while. You know, you can quantify their reach, especially if this is something that might be, you know, an ongoing order year after year. Um, this is, some, again, a way to create leverage. You can also recognize the nursery for their efforts and sustainability. Um, if you are, you know, especially a private business, that may be really easy to do. If you're a government, you might be able to do that as well. If you're a nonprofit, you might need to be careful because nonprofits are under particular tax rules about you know, favoring one kind of business or another, it has to be, anyway, you need to look into that. But if you can recognize the nurseries that are going, uh, you know, this route with you for their efforts, um, you can consider preferred vendor status. And then of course, providing resources and information about why this is important is often um, very appreciated. So that concludes my presentation. Um, I just want to say thanks a lot. And if you think you are interested in pursuing this route or talking to people in your community about this, I invite you to reach out to me afterwards and we can talk in more detail about our process. I've got our uh, first book well, before I go to my email, which I'm going to put up there so that you can email me if you are interested in more. Um, thank you so much to all of our supporters. Thank you to Pollinator Friendly Alliance for inviting me here today and all the rest of the Xerxes uh, staff. And um, you can join the movement. Um, everything that we do is only made possible by all the supporters that we have. So if you'd like, you can go to our website and become a Xerxes member today. And there's my email if you want to contact me to get more information about this approach. Thanks. You can leave that up if you want, sharing your slide. Um, and if you don't mind, we have so many questions, but I'll pose just a few. few and I, I'd like to acknowledge yours and others like Jennifer and Rosemary at Xerxes for the hard work of advocating and educating to reduce insecticides. It, I, I'm sure people don't probably know, but I've, I've seen you in action and it's amazing the work that you've been doing. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lori. Yeah. Pat yourself on the back too for all of the work that you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we know, of course, that neonicotinoids are a huge problem in our landscapes, not only in horticulture. Um, so uh, please uh, try to remove those out of your own landscapes and 
and get the word out if you can. So um, one question, well, I guess I could combine these two. Do you know if plugs are generally treated um, and uh, for plants, is there a rule for crossing state lines or county lines? And if there is, are those plant, plants typically dumped or sprayed? Did you say dumped? Dumped, like in dumped. a bag. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let me just take those one at a time. Um, plugs um, sometimes are, are treated. I mean, I think the frequency of treatment will vary from place to place, nursery to nursery. Um, we also know that a lot of plugs are produced, um, what they call liner plants, which are even smaller, are produced um, overseas and then brought to the US. Um, so it's kind of hard to know sometimes the exact provenance of some of these plants that we buy and how many nurseries they've been through. Some nurseries focus on um, propagation and that's pretty much all they do. And other nurseries will buy those plugs or liners and, and they will grow them out from there. Um, sometimes woody plants are a specialty, you know, and certain companies will propagate those. Dunks or basically immersing the roots in um, a solution is not at all uncommon. Um, again, like I can't speak for across the board because every nursery has different practices, but this is something that you often see um, at that stage. Um, there may also be sprays or granules applied at that stage um, in order, and systemics are common when the plants are really young because they provide such long lasting, you know, protection against um, plant pests. So we see that oftentimes nursery growers are applying things when the plants are really young so that they have some kind of sense of peace of mind for themselves that, hey, I don't need to worry about that because I protected the plant early. Remember that what we call pesticides, the pesticide industry calls plant protection <laughs> agents <laughs> or crop <laughs> protection agents. So, you know, this idea of protecting the plant through use of pesticides is, is the, you know, the kind of the mindset. we that's fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. We just know that there's a lot of effects to the ecosystem by the widespread use of pesticides. So yeah, as far as crossing state lines, um, it can really vary again, but um, typically any nursery needs to worry about shipping across state lines and whether the plant health regulations of that state that they're shipping to, they're compliant with that. Sometimes it's down to the county level, like in, in California, there are county level quarantines in place, but it's a complex landscape. I'll just leave it at that because somebody else could speak better to that. Um, yeah. Okay. So in, in our neighborhood or our actually our region, there are specific nurseries that are growers, I should say rather, that don't use any pesticides. And I know that a lot of groups will have plant lists up on their website, like we do, of um, growers and uh, plant suppliers that are safe, that have vetted, been vetted. And have you seen that around the country in different areas? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I used to work for Northwest Center for alternatives to pesticides, and that's exactly how I first came into this work myself, because um, when they hired me on, this was back in 2015, and one of my big tasks was basically creating a list of nurseries that weren't using neonics on their plants, and we put up a similar list like that, like other others do, um, but we, uh, we looked... Um, we looked at all of their practices, you know, it, to the best of my ability at the time. And I was really new to this at that time, but we didn't just call them up and say, are you using neonics? We were also asking deeper questions about how they grew, what some of their practices were. I'd say at Xerces, we take a, a more holistic view of sort of the neonic question. First of all, we know that neonics on their own are not the only concerning pesticide 
The fungicides that I talked about in this program are one example of another set of chemicals that we know have some you know, issues with monarchs at least. Um, but we, we have been really advocating for years now that we need to go beyond asking nurseries about new nicks alone. And we need to start asking them, how are they preventing their pest problems in the first place? Like what kind of practices do they utilize to keep diseases and insect infestations, pest insect infestations down from the beginning, you know? Um, and some nurseries do a great job of that. Almost all nurseries do something, but it's really a, a kind of a illuminating to find out what different nurseries do. Um, we also ask about how closely and systematically they monitor for, for pests and diseases. And so that's also an indication of how carefully the nursery is tracking things because it's almost always easier to nip a problem in the bud. So if they're keeping a close eye on things through a regular monitoring program, they can be more likely if they have to use a pesticide to keep it really targeted and small. So we really encourage people to ask not just about pesticides, but ask about those prevention practices and monitoring practices. And in those fact sheets, we kind of outline some of those questions.